Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Tom. I'm with RACO, and uh, thanks for joining us today. Uh, today's webinar is on air sampling, and we'll be covering the basics of personal sampling. Our guest to host today is Dan Bingham. Uh, Dan is currently the National Sales Manager for Sensodyne, and he has over 20 years' experience in air sampling. So thanks for joining us today, Dan. Uh, we will be allowing time for questions at the end of the presentation. Uh, probably be using the chat button at the bottom of the GoToMeeting tab that's uh, showing up on your on your computer screen. Um, we'll also be recording this, and you'll be able to view it in the future on Rayco.com under our training page. So without further ado, I'll pass it over to Dan and uh, go from there. So thanks so much for joining us, Dan. Uh, thank you, Tom. Uh, those of you that are not familiar with Sensodyne, uh, it's located in the factory. It's actually located in St. Petersburg, Florida, and we manufacture the Gillian air sampling pumps. Let's see, why is my button not scrolling down here? There we go. Okay, personal air, personal sampling basics. We're just going to pretty much do an overview of personal air sampling. You see there's a personal air sampling pump connected to the belt of this worker. You also see where the cassette filter is located. It's very close to the breathing zone. And the purpose is really is to collect an air sample that's representative of a worker's breathing zone. Representative air sampling connected, conducted over the entire work shift uh, also collects air sample uh, around the worker's face. Doesn't get in the way of doing the job. Sometimes that's a little bit of an issue. You see there's sometimes there's pouches and things like that that can, uh, protective pouches that can be used for the air sampling pump too on the worker's belt or there's a harness. So there's a couple different ways that you can actually fasten the air sampling pump. And we're looking to uh, provide a reliable flow rate and a volume. All right. In this picture, you can actually see a little bit better where that filter cassette is actually attached to the worker's collar. And it's usually using, like what they say, is a lapel clip to connect to that collar. There's a few different types of filter cassettes. We'll get into that a little bit later. And then from there, you'll see the rubber tubing that's actually connected from the air sampling pump to the filter cassette. And then from there, based upon what we're looking for, when you're using a filter cassette, we're dust sampling. And uh, depending upon what type of dust we're looking to collect, that's what the flow rates and that that the pump are set to based upon the different method that you're using. So an air sampling pump draws, and draws air through the collection media for the evaluation of the worker exposure to a targeted substance during the work shift. And the samples are collected using a filter cassette or, or, or absorbent tube that's then later analyzed in a laboratory. Absorbent tubes are usually associated with collecting on uh, or collecting for different solvents, and the cassettes are usually looking for particulates. So an air sampling pump. There's different types of air sampling pumps, and some of them can actually do both low flow sampling as well as high flow sampling. And some of them are just dedicated for low flow sampling. Again, low flow sampling would be looking more so for solvents. So personal pump high flow, usually typically what we're looking for is a range between one to five liters a minute. <clears throat> That's what most of the methods are that uh, uh, require those types of flow rates. Uh, some of the uh, constituents that you might be looking for with high flow sampling would be lead, asbestos, total dust. And the accessories that would be used for this type of sampling are filters, cyclones, and impingers. For low flow, you're looking at a flow range typically between 20 cc's a minute to 3 liters a minute. Uh, hydrocarbon solvents, for instance, like for benzene, which would be a proven carcinogen, which is always a concern. Chlorinated solvents, alcohols, 
And what we're looking for on there is usually sorbent tubes. 80% of the sorbents would use char charcoal tubes for sampling. Now, on a pump, which is very important for, for a pump that uh, um, actually, in, uh, since probably about, I'd say, the late 1990s, constant flow control is an added feature to an air sampling pump, which is very important. What this will do for you is that the pump will actually accelerate during a run if your filter media or your absorbent tube is actually starting to plug up with sample, uh, dust, anything like that now, which is going to restrict your flow rate. So the pump recognizes this and actually adjusts to increase speed to make sure that you're sampling at the correct flow rate. So it works like a cruise control on a car. It senses when the flow rate is trying to drop and speeds up the pump. It maintains the flow rate at plus or minus 5% of whatever the flow rate is set to. Multi-flow, low, low flow sample pumps. Uh, constant pressure control allows for two to four simultaneous samples using special manifolds. So a constant low pressure level is maintained in the connecting tubing. And flow rate is controlled with a needle valve on each of the flow holders. So at this point right here, what we're doing is disconnecting that knurled knob. Below that knurled knob is a screwdriver adjustment. And this is where you're going to be actually adjusting your flow rate when you're sampling in constant flow. So this pump here can actually do both. It can do constant flow and it can do constant pressure. When we're in constant flow, you'll be adjusting your flow rate on the pump itself. When you're using this type of adapter and you're doing multi-tubes, well now you'll set the pump into constant pressure and you'll actually make your flow rate adjustment here. From here, what you're doing is you're connecting then to your calibrator. And that's what you'll be doing is you'll make your adjustment here, and then you'll be watching your calibrator, and then you'll be seeing your flow rates adjust accordingly. All right, to give you an idea with the difference between constant flow versus constant pressure, we're using this example of a spigot. So what you're really doing on your pump is you're taking your air sampling pump and you're just about maximizing the flow rate on the pump. So the pump has the capability of uh, being, let's say it does about five liters a minute, well you're opening up that pump pretty close to the high end for the most part. Uh, there is some exceptions to that. Some of our pumps were pretty much the flow rate is about one and a half liters a minute. What happens is when you open it up at that constant pressure point, that's you will not be using the pump anymore to make adjustments on flow rate. You'll be making your flow rate adjustments on the adapter that's connected to whatever type of sorbent media that you're using. So here the flow rate's coming out, let's say about one and a half to two liters a minute, and now you're just tapping into this source and just a small flow rate, anywhere between 50 to 200 cc's a minute. When you're going into using a, uh, a pump that has the capability of doing high and low flow, well, you have to actually put on some type of an adapter now to be able to use it for low flow capability. So here we're putting on a pump, uh, an adapter on this uh, Gilair 5, which will allow it now to be able to do either constant pressure or constant flow. There's an adapter for each to be able to do low flow sampling capability. You don't really need that adapter when you're doing high flow. So some pump models require modules to achieve lower flow rates. Calibration of these units requires special consideration. Now in a constant flow module, all right, so here we see that we're doing a low flow application. So we have the adapter, we're doing low flow. And then from here we're setting the flow rate to 1500 cc's a minute. Turning your on and off switch. And then from here, we're putting in our charcoal tube or some type of uh, absorbent media. 
and there's no adjustment made on this section of the tubing when we're in constant flow. We're just making our flow rate adjustment here. Now when we go into a constant pressure application where we want to do multi-tube sampling, well now the pump, again, is going to be set to 1,500 cc's and then we're making our adjustments here instead of on the pump for low flow. So this one here again is constant pressure and the one seen previously is constant flow. We're making again our adjustments here in multi-tubes. You'll be actually using a screwdriver adjustment here to set your flow to your calibrator based upon your readings on your calibrator. Some of these uh, multi-tube uh, manifolds, you'll see we have a single, a double, triple, and a quad. That comes in handy if you're looking for multi-solvents or different ranges of solvents because these tubes these charcoal tubes or different sorbent tubes come in different sizes. So if you're looking for a higher concentration, what you'd want to do is use a larger tube. If you're not sure what the concentration is, you might be using a smaller tube, a medium-sized tube, and a larger tube just to make sure that you encompass the concentration that you're looking for. Or if you're looking for diversity in the number of volatiles that, uh, that may be present, you might be using a charcoal tube, you might be using a 10x tube, you might be using a chromosorb tube based upon the compounds that you're looking for and the method requirements. So here you're, you're adding diversity to the amount of compounds that you can look at in one sampling event. All right. Now what happens also, and sometimes mostly more associated with filter cassette sampling rather than solvent sampling, is that you'll actually get what they call cassette loading, all right? And that's the amount of dust that starts to accumulate on your filter cassette. So back pressure is usually typical of, um, that occurs during uh, your sampling event, especially in very dusty environments. So here, let's say if you're hooking up your filter cassette, you're actually pulling up, a, uh, pulling a small load during the initial part of your run. And then as you start to accumulate more and more dust, well now it's taking more power from the pump that you'll actually need to maintain that flow rate. And then usually during the end of the run, you know, you're actually at your most extreme conditions so far as with the back pressure might be. So the small car must work progressively harder to pull the various trailers at, as they increase in size. Air sampling pumps must also work harder to pull all air through sampling media of increasing back pressure. As far as measuring back pressure, again, if you're, uh, you're looking at um, not a vacuum, but a low pressure system, and you're usually using a, a gauge that would measure in inches of water, uh, so your back pressure is measured by tapping into the low pressure area between the pump and the sampling media. And the gauge is called the manometer. All right, the manometer actually measures in use, units of inches of water, originally measured using U-shaped tubes. So you had a certain volume of water within the tube, and then from there what you're doing is you're actually measuring your, your partial, partial vacuum um, in inches of water as it's being drawn up the tube. Back pressure principles. Well, the higher the flow rate, usually the higher the back pressure. If your pump is faulting, you might have to actually drop your your flow rate down a little bit to uh, to accommodate the uh, the filter um, requirements in regards to the uh, back pressure that's associated with it. Uh, usually, the smaller the filter cassette, the higher the back pressure. So you have a 25 millimeter cassette actually has double the back pressure of a 37 millimeter cassette with the same filter membrane. That's just all relative to surface area. So the smaller the surface area, usually more back pressure associated with it. 
right? And also then you have to look at the, the filter pore size and uh, higher back pressure is also associated with the filter pore size. So smaller, smaller pore size, 0 0.8 micron, micrometers actually will produce a higher back pressure than a pore size of 5 micrometers. All right, so the hole size, as obviously as that gets smaller, well, it's going to require more and more power from the pump to pull the flow rate, the desired flow rate. Here you'll see uh, a graph of the back pressure of, uh, of common filters associated with the, uh, the different flow rates on the pump. And you can see the back pressure drop as with the increase of the, of the amount of uh, flow rate on the pump as well as you see the different types of cassettes. And here you'll see like that 25 millimeter cassette, pretty much that's asbestos type sampling. Uh, you'll see that is probably the one of the higher requirements of a pump to have the capability to be able to handle the back pressure of that type of sampling. Most of the time your sampling flow rates are typically around two liters a minute, two to three liters a minute. You're not going to really sample at really the high end uh, four to five liters a minute is kind of uncommon, especially when you're looking at doing OSHA compliance type sampling, which you're using NIOSH and OSHA type methods. So different pumps. Here's an example of, of our pumps it's associated with flow rates versus uh, um, the capability in regards to uh, low flow, high flow, if it has that capability. And then also you'll see down at the bottom uh, versus different flow rates with the capability of the back pressure is. So if we're looking at here, for instance, on a, uh, a Gill Air 5, right, and we see that we have uh, flow rates associated from 1 cc all the way up to 5,000 cc's. Our, our high flow range is 750 to 5 liters a minute. Low flow is typically between 1 and 5 cc's. And now if we go down here, we'll actually see, okay, if we're sampling, let's say at 2 liters a minute, what type of back pressure maximum capability do you have for that type of flow rate. So you're looking here at 37 inches of water, vacuum, low pressure, 29 inches of water for an eight hour run. All right, so that's what's important to you to understand when you're doing your air sampling, what you're gonna come up against in regards to the background in the area that you're actually sampling. So if it's a very dusty environment, you want to make sure that the pump has the capability to handle high back pressure. There's a few of the different types of air sampling uh, accessories. You have a filter cassette. You see here we have a three-piece filter cassette. Here you have, if you want to just collect a, a graph sample, usually what we're doing is you're filling up a Tedlar bag and you're filling that up like here's, this looks like to be like about a one liter Tedlar bag. These uh, bags come as, as high as a 100, 100 liter Tedlar bag. For some of the environmental uh, applications, you're looking at collecting like 50 to 100 liters. Here's another type of filter cassette. What we're doing here is looking on this is actually doing some particle sizing to actually get down to collecting dust, but at a certain particle size, maybe dropping down to about 10 microns, 1 micron, and 5 micron. So you would use this type of cassette, filter cassette, for that type of sampling. Here you have different charcoal tubes, and they come in a variety of different sizes. So sometimes there's a there's a hundred milligram, a hundred and fifty milligram, three hundred milligram, and a six hundred milligram charcoal tube. And based upon the concentrations that you're looking at for your application, you would choose that tube size accordingly. And also in regards to the method restriction. And I'm gonna we'll go through some of the methods here in a little while, a little further down through this presentation. 
impingers, usually what this is, uh, they're kind of phasing this out because these are difficult to work with. And what you're doing is you're putting in a solvent here like an alcohol or hexane or so like that. And then from there, you're usually collecting another type of solvent. And, and then from there, uh, that is actually sent, then they're actually putting that into a container, that solvent after the end of, this, uh, of the run. And that's being sent to a laboratory for analysis. The cyclone is using the filter cassette usually in combination with this device called the cyclone because of particle size. And what you want to do now is collect a sample that's about four microns on the average of particle size. This is a, a small particle size. Typically why they're doing this is because you want to be able to collect the dust that's associated with within the, uh, the alveoli, the respiratory section, and the lung section that could actually gain access because of the small particle size that can actually penetrate and get down into that zone of the, uh, of the body within the lungs. Um, usually it's, it's one to five microns that's associated with that. Five to ten is in the thoracic zone, which would be the throat. And then from there, uh, larger dust size between 10 to 50 microns would be usually accumulated within the mouth and the nose. So in using a, a charcoal tube, what we're doing here is inserting it into the holder. And because of the neural knob on this side, this is, they're actually doing a constant flow because there's no flow adjustment on this type of knob. All there is is just a tubing connect at the end right here where the thumb is blocking. You're breaking both ends of the tubes. You have two sections of charcoal tube which is kind of masked by the threading here on the holder. And then from there you see the flow direction and then that the other neural knob then is, is uh, put on this end and then your tubing is also uh, either connected here or actually when you're doing your calibration part of things and then the tubing is taken off when you're actually doing your sample, the sample actually will be coming in at this point. Absorbent tubes are designed to collect airborne gases and vapors. Uh, they work because the target gases adhere to the surface of the collection media. It's a temporary type of adsorption. Uh, for the most part, charcoal tubes are going to be uh, extracted using a certain solvent. Uh, and then from there, that solvent is uh, analyzed either on a GC or mass spec in a laboratory to determine concentrations of your target analytes. All right, they're designed for low flow rates, usually between 20 cc's and 200 cc's a minute. Again, it's all based upon the methods and the amount of time that you can actually sample uh, based upon your application for the person that you're actually trying to sample, how many hours that this person is actually doing a project and you want to sample them for. The target gas is recovered in the lab by desorption, either chemical or thermal. Charcoal, again, is usually a chemical extraction. Some other types of absorbents like uh, 10x chromosorb can go either way. You can either extract it with a solvent or what they'll do is they can heat that tube up within a, a gas chromatograph on a purge and trap type system and then from there they can extract the target analytes that way and analyze them on the gas chromatograph in that spec. All right, types of absorbent tubes. Many types of materials have been applied to absorbent tubes and to uh, specified in various air sampling methods. Most have been borrowed from gas chromatograph technology. Examples are 10X, Poropac, XAD, all associated with their different properties associated with your target analytes on how well they'll temporarily absorb to that medium. Some have higher extraction efficiencies or, um, than others. However, the most commonly used type absorbent tube contains activated charcoal. Eighty percent of the different NIOSH methods that you'll be using to use for air sampling uh, is activated charcoal. 
sorbent tube design. Sorbent tube is usually made in two layers, unequal sizes. Um, the reason being is, is that this large there will be a, uh, a large section of charcoal tube here, as you see that you're, this is where your sample is initially coming in through. And there's a maximum capacity that the target analyte can be temporarily adsorbed onto that first section. So if the concentration exceeds that, well then now you would get what they call breakthrough. And it goes on to the smaller section, a one-third section of charcoal here. So in the laboratory, typically what they'll do is when they get this tube and they want to analyze it, well they'll break the tube open, they'll take this section of charcoal tube first, they'll analyze that and they'll see if there's any hits of the analytes, your target analytes. If they find a hit, well, then they know that the sample is null and void because they got breakthrough. So if there's no breakthrough, then what they'll do is they'll actually analyze this section. And then from there, they'll determine what the actual concentrations are that the you know, worker was exposed to. All right, again, most popular absorbent tubes, activated charcoal. These are typically some of the different solvents. Uh, there would be hydrocarbon type solvents, alcohol, alcohol ketones, methylene chloride, benzene, silica gel, acid gases, uh, wash silica gel, and then regular silica gel would be for the amines, ammonia, and XAD2, which would be for formaldehyde and then aldehydes. Sorbent tube holders, we talked a little bit about that before. Again, these are all associated with the constant pressure type sampling, right? Because you'll be making all your adjustments on your tubes at this point. Remove this middle knob, again, screwdriver adjustment here. You can adjust 50 cc's on this one. 100 cc's on this one, let's say, uh, maybe a different size tube in this one of the same media as this one is. So what you have is a lot of diversity here and be able to do your sampling application. And then from here, what you have is just, if you know there's just one, one or two analytes that can be analyzed like on a charcoal tube or so like that, then again, you're making your adjustment for your flow rate and using it, using again, in a constant pressure type application. Now, constant flow, where your flow rate's actually adjusted now on the pump, and you're just using one tube in constant flow mode, then you'll be using this, this type of a tube as your holder. What you have to look at, and it's really not so much of an issue when you're looking at constant pressure versus constant flow, when you're using this mechanism on top here, well, your flow rate at the beginning of your eight-hour run, let's say, is set at 50 cc's a minute. But we're in constant pressure, so the pump if there's any type of restriction development throughout your sampling run, let's say if there's moisture or if there's dust in extreme situation, at the end of your eight hour run, your flow rate might be a little bit different. Uh, OSHA, I think is plus or minus 10% as, as based upon the beginning of your run as compared to the end of your run. So that long as you're within that criteria, then you have a valid sampling event. So you cannot actually maintain constant flow rate when you're working within constant pressure. But when you're looking at absorbent tubes, it's really not an issue, and only in extreme situations. But when you're working in constant flow, there's no question about it. Your flow rate's always going to be maintained within plus or minus 5%. Understanding filter sampling. Now we're looking at uh, your high flow sampling. And many different materials are used in filter sets as called out by the sampling method. All right, so you have MCEF, you have PVC, you have PTFE, glass fiber. These are all the types of the filter media is actually made of that the sample is being collected on. So filters are normally described by three parameters, the diameter, the pore size, and the membrane material. So an example of that would be we have a 37 millimeter cassette, five micron pore size, 
and we have a material PVC. The filter material for a given sampling method is usually chosen all right, to be compatible with the lab method. All right, so typically what you're doing is you have to contact the lab, let them know that you're going to be sampling, let's say, for hexavalent chromium and that you want to make sure that they have the capability, tell them that you're going to be using, let's say, your NIOSH method, such and such number. Do they have the capability of the analytical equipment to accommodate that type of sampling? So you have to make sure that you coordinate that with your lab, that they'll have the capability to analyze your sampling. And there's many industrial, uh, or rather, uh, IH-type labs that uh, for the most part, always have the capability to analyze any of like the NIOSH methods. So the pore size of a filter membrane does not determine the size of the particle that will collect on the filter. So in other words, your your the pore size on the filter membrane is is important to make sure that the particle size does not actually go through the filter. There are many different types. Uh, you have conductive, two-part or three-part, MCEF, PVC, PTEFE, 37 millimeter or 25 millimeter, gridded, and banded. These are all the different types of, of filter cassettes that you would use for high flow sampling and again all based upon your target analytes. The filter sampling methods, sampling methods are published by NIOSH, OSHA, EPA that will describe the type of membrane used. So that's how much pretty much you determine what you're going to need. You would take this method, you would look it up, and it says, well, you'd be using a specific type of a cassette with a certain type of uh, filter. And it's pretty much all outlined, defined right for you within the method. So the sample flow rate will also be described in the sampling method. Usually what they do is they'll give you a range on that. Um, one to four liters a minute, let's say, would be an example of, let's say, a certain method. And they're giving you some flexibility there to choose that. The volume is pretty much defined. All right, so you'll need to know that you need to pull uh, 50 liters of volume. And then from there, it'll give you a range of the flow rate. And the runtime usually has flexibility as well. But for your application, let's say, for instance, you're looking at a welder. Well, your welder is only going to be welding for three or four hours, and then that's the end of his, end of his job, and that's all he's going to be doing. So now what you'll do is, based upon you know that you have four hours of sampling, you'll choose your flow rate. And uh, based upon the volume that's indicated within that method, to accumulate that sample runtime that you need to do for four hours. So from there, you'll make those calculations based upon your, on your specific application using the guidelines of the method. Filter membranes are identified by three, three uh, criteria, the diameter in millimeters, the pore size in microns, and the material. For example, can we cover a little bit of this, 37 millimeters, 5 microns, PVC, describes a filter type specified for dust sample. So if you're doing total dust, this is typically the cassette that you would be normally using for that type of sampling. And again, that's defined in the NIOSH method. There are many types of filter media, MCE or MCEF. It's mixed cellulose ester fiber, PVC, polyvinyl chloride, TTFE, polytetrafluoroethylene or Teflon, glass fiber and polycarbonate. Now, filter membrane may be plain or gridded. Uh, again, this is going to be associated with the type of analysis for the target. So, grid lines are often preferred by microscopic analysis. Um, this would be like, uh, like asbestos would be a typical of that. Uh, there's some types of silica, things all like that, that would be using a microscopic analysis. Grid lines may be offered in different colors to facilitate a microscope count, 
when the dyes are used. Filter cassettes may have further description. A two-piece cassette consists of a two-press fit part cassette. Then you have a three-piece cassette center ring to allow open face sampling. So what you're doing on the end piece of that cassette is usually you're removing it so that when you're sampling that full 37 millimeters is, is actually sample collecting through an open face. The closed face are usually more associated with the two with the two uh, piece cassette. And then from there there's a hole that's within the center of that cassette. That's where the sample is actually coming in at. Uh, conductive will not build static charge. And then banded has a shrink band around the press joint for tamper seal. Asbestos filters may be described by the test method. Right. So PCM is a phase contrast microscope analysis is specified in the OSHA and NIOSH sampling methods. PCM methods are intended for personal monitoring pumps. There's other types of asbestos sampling that should be doing more so with high flow. Uh, TEM is transmission electron microscope analysis is specified in EPA HERA test methods. Note that TEM methods are intended for area pumps. So these are area pumps usually are uh, associated too again with, with high flow sampling. And that would be up to, uh, well it can be a lot of different flow rates. Typically though for indoor air quality type ones for high flow you could be up as 30 liters a minute. And flow, and flow resistance can be too high for a personal air sampling pump. This is what your filter cassette, all the different pieces associated with the three-piece cassette. So this is usually when you're doing open face, this is usually removed. So now you're actually collecting your sample at this point. So you actually have your filter here. You have a support pad, just makes for, for more even sampling. And then the support part of the cassette to hold the filter and the, and the support. You have a little bit of a lower fitting, which connects as a friction type fit to the, to the uh, plastic cassette. You have to be careful when inserting this. A lot of times that these plastic cassettes are, when inserting, there is very possible to actually crack the filter cassette and then from there you'll actually get leakage so you'll not get the actual full flow rate then coming through uh, at this point you know to collect on your filter you could actually get seepage in coming in through this point so always make sure when you are inserting this that there is no crack in the, in the plastic fitting on your on your cassette most popular filters well the 37 millimeter cassette PVC that would be typically used for dust, silica, hexavalent chrome. 37, 8 micron MCE would be for lead, pretty much most of the other metals. Uh, 25 millimeter cassette would be for your asbestos, PCM. And then a 25 millimeter cassette with a 45 uh, micron polycarbonate or MCE is asbestos TEM. Again, that particle to the uh, filter sizing on this is going to create a lot of back pressure. So that's why they're saying a personal air sampling pump might not have the capability to be able to do this type of sampling because of the back pressure criteria. You might require a larger pump like a 30 liter pump that would have a higher back pressure capability to be able to handle to do this type of TEM sampling. All right, personal cyclone sampler. Again, this is for looking at the respirable dust fraction. Again, it's going to be going down into the lung, into the alveoli. So we're looking at a particle size separation here, of getting down to four microns. So the mechanism here is what we're doing is, is that your your sample is actually entering in at this point of the device and then from there the heavy particles are actually being dropped down and collected at this point. So all your particle sizing that's typically about five microns and lower are being captured here. And the other 
smaller particle size in the four microns and uh, into the nanoparticles actually, then are actually being collected up here onto the, uh, the filter cassette material. This is a Dora Oliver cyclone. There's a few different types of cyclone. Typically when you're working with a Dora Oliver, you're looking at a 1.7 liter a minute flow rate. Um, it specified the actual cyclone specified a flow rate that needs to work with it so that you'll actually get the physics part of the particle sizing separation and flow rate's important that the pump be kept at that flow rate. All right, so a personal cyclone sampler, which you'll see here is the particle size distribution with the cyclone closely matches the particle penetration within the lung. So that Dora Oliver cyclone that we were just looking at on the previous page at 1.7 liters a minute. And you can see the particle size. And you can see also the percent penetration. Cyclone flow rates, the flow rates must match the flow specification on the cyclone. Here's a couple different cyclones. There's, there's a, quite a few of them out there. All of them have their own flow rates associated. Again, it's really just to get that particle size separation to maximize on that 4 micron to 5 micron particle size. Handleable dust sampler, uh, it samples at 2 liters a minute, collects airborne dust, sizes up to 100 microns, uses its 25 millimeter filter membrane. There's a few of these that you can use that will, that maybe get a little bit more size specific. So it's, all, it's like a one-piece type sampler instead of like a, where you're actually inserting a filter cassette inside the cyclone. Here, this is just a one-piece type cyclone filter combination. Particle size fractions, inhalable dust, hazardous when deposited anywhere in the respiratory tracts. So particles of 100 micron and smaller. So 100 microns, again, that means that you're going to get anything within the nose as well as in the mouth. Um, some people say uh, up to 100 microns. Typically, it could be 50 to 100 microns would be the particle size that you would associate with the mouth and nose. Thoracic dust is uh, hazardous when deposited anywhere within the lung, airways, gases exchange region. Particles of 20 microns and smaller, 50% at 10 microns. And again, that's usually what you're looking at is within the, within the throat region. And uh, the respirable dust, which are even the smallest particle sizes, which then would be associated with the lung and the alveoli area. Particle sizes of 10 microns and smaller. Air sampling pump calibration. Here what you're seeing is that your calibrator always goes on the end of the sampling train. So you're hooking up your air sampling pump through your filter cassette. And then from there, you're actually looking, you're calibrating. You're going to set this, let's say, at 2 liters a minute. Or well, here they actually have it 3.5 liters a minute. And then from there, what you're doing is, OK, well, I set the pump at 3,500 cc's. What is the actual flow rate now that I'm actually getting through this train? So you look here, you'll see that, let's say it's at 3 liters or 3.1 liters a minute. Well, now you'll have to make an adjustment on your pump to match that uh, or of, the, of the calibrator. And then from there, when you hit, it, hit the Enter key, the pump will actually now speed up to get to the desired flow rate of 3,500. Again, now you double check it. How much did it increase? 
And then from there, you'll see that, okay, it's up to 3.5 liters a minute. That's using this type of a pump. If you're using like a Gill Air 5 pump and some of the other uh, competitor pumps out there that you'll see is that you're using a screwdriver adjustment to actually increase flow rate. And then from there, you're actually seeing, well, when you turn the screw either clockwise or counterclockwise, it's making a difference on your calibrator on what the actual flow rate is. So here we're using like a soap solution bubble. Uh, what it's doing is it's generating a, a bubble with the soap solution and it travels up a certain distance. And then from there, that's actually how they're gaining what the actual flow rate is. There's a secondary type source of a calibration, which is using a rotometer. And then from there, what you're doing is you have a small little ball and a glass tube. And then from there, as you're making your adjustment, the tube is going up and uh, the ball is going up and down within the tube. Right. What's important to understand is that there's two different types of calibrators. There's a primary calibrator and there's a secondary calibrator. And if you want to be, let's say, in compliance with NIOSH, you have to understand what the NIOSH primary calibrator is. All right. So here it gives you a good idea of that where it says, um, you know, various techniques used for measuring sampling rates, sample volumes. In the laboratory calibration samples will be discussed in terms of their principles of operation and their source of error. Some may be considered primary measurements, while some are secondary or derived. So primary measurements are generally involved a direct measurement of volume. So here you see that volume is the key word here on the basis of physical dimensions in an enclosed space. NIOSH, going back in the 70s, would typically use a a burette, and they would measure flow rate with the soap solution going up a uh, measured volume within the burette. And they would use a stopwatch from the start at the time that the bubble was a certain point at the, and then at the point that it reached one liter. And that's how they would get their flow rate, using a stopwatch. Um, so they're basing this on that principle in measuring volume. All right, and NIOSH Manual of Analytical Methods, there's, I, ex I forget exactly how many, but there's hundreds of methods based upon the target analytes. You might find two or three methods for one type of compound, maybe even more. Um, for instance, like benzene, I think there's probably at least three or four NIOSH methods to analyze for benzene. Uh, changes from one method to the other are based maybe upon the analytical methods the amount of volume, and also detection levels, uh, all are the criteria for the difference in the methods. Uh, anyway, the choice of reference instrument will be depend upon where the calibration is to be performed. Laboratory use primary standards, again, volume, all right, uh, such as spirometer, soap bubble meter are recommended. Several electronic soap, soap bubble calibrators, which you see an example of the gilibrator, and one dry cell calibrator are commercially available as calibrators, and those would be considered as your primary. Other instruments such as wet test, mass flow, dry gas meters may also be used. So technology has developed you know, within the last few years. Now you'll see there's quite a few different calibrators out there just besides the soap solution type systems. Soap solution though, has been around for well, at least 30 years or so. So they're still very popular. Um, there is dry cows. There's mass flow. Um, a few different principles out there that now are being used as primary calibrators. Here's an example. Yeah, the primary calibrator, traditional one. This is what they base everything on. So what you're doing here is you're generating a soap bubble that travels from one liter based upon whatever flow rate, you'll adjust your pump then, you know, to the desired flow rate that you're looking for, but the real flow rate would be measured at this point based upon when to start and stop. Typically, you're not going to find that around very much anymore. Unless you have an industrial hygienist that's uh, um, been an industrial hygienist for about 30 or 40 years, that's comfortable with that, but there's a lot easier methods now. 
primary airflow calibrators, primary standards by NIOSH definition must incorporate a measured volume. Examples include bubble meters and piston calibrators. A dry, uh, a dry cow is actually an example of a piston calibrator. So again, uh, a near frictionless piston is actually moving up to certain volume within a, a, a chamber. Secondary airflow calibrators. Um, this type of system is using a Venturi, um, and it's good for like flow rates up to 1 to 30 liters a minute, but it doesn't cover your low flow range. So it's not a primary by NIOSH definition. Again, the technology is kind of new, Venturi. Uh, it's not something that they've actually tested to be accepted as a primary. No measure, no measure volume incorporated can still be NIST traceable, uh, which is usually the, the standard within industry as, as being certified uh, for other different types of uh, instrumentation. Samples include rotometers, rotometers, mass flow devices, and pressure differential devices. Gillian air sampling pump field calibration. This is a step-by-step -step guide here. All right, with items required. This would be for, uh, looks like we're going to do a high flow application because we're using the filter cassette. Pump needs to have the capability to be able to do, meet the demands of whatever filters that you're going to be using and whatever the NIOSH method specifies or OSHA method. And then you'll also need a different type of calibrator. For instance, you'll be using a soap solution calibrator. That's an electronic calibrator. Calibration consists of two parts. You have a pre-cal, which is done before the sample is taken. And then a post-cal is done after the sample is taken. What's important to know is if you're looking at the OSHA guidelines for air sampling, and I got a document that I'm going to show you here at the end of the presentation. Um, the OSHA guidelines are something you might want to get a copy of so that you'll understand how they do their actual field sampling. And they always recommend a pre-cal and a post-cal. So that means that when you go out and you start the sample, that you want to make a measurement at that point to assure that the flow rate has been properly set. And then again, at the, when you complete the run, then you want to make a measurement at that point to determine what the actual flow rate is as compared to what you actually started the run at. So if we started the run, let's say we did the pre-cal, we're at 2 liters a minute, did we finish up at that point? Are we within plus or minus 10% or 5%? If we're doing constant flow sampling, we should be within plus or minus 5%. If you're doing constant pressure, well, it could be it could be actual a greater percentage difference. Uh, but OSHA, I think, typically accepts, and I might be, need to be corrected on that. I'd have to look at that guideline, but I think 10% is the maximum difference that they'll accept that you have a valid sampling event. The pre-cal is used to set the desired sample flow rate and to verify it on an airflow calibrator. Conducting the pre-cal, again, we'll be making your actual flow rate adjustment using the screwdriver on this pump to get it to the desired flow rate. And so you'll be checking here, making a few different runs with the bubble traveling up the uh, of up the uh, uh, glass tube, and then from there, um, you'll actually be determined you're getting your reading on what the average flow rate would be. So that would be done at the start of your run. And then when you finish up, again, you'll be doing the same thing just to verify um, what your flow rate is, and then you're going to be recording those readings. Actually, that was all pre-cal part of it, I'm sorry. Yeah, set the flow rate, observe the flow rate, record the flow rate, and average 
when readings recommended. Then you're actually going to be running your sample. So the pump is placed on the belt. Sample media is placed on the lapel breathing zone, pointed downward. Record the stop time and record the end time. Post-cal is used to obtain the final flow rate and to verify that the flow rate stayed within plus or minus 5% 5, 5 of the set flow. All right, your average flow rate then is determined based upon the difference divided by 2, you know, for the pre-cal as, as compared to the post-cal. And then you get your average flow rate. And that's what you're actually going to be submitting to the laboratory, that flow rate, your time, and then from there you could actually calculate out what your volume is that you collected on that sample. All those parameters are turned into the lab. Determining the average flow rate the cyclone calibration. Only a 10 millimeter nylon cyclone has only an exit fitting and must be placed inside a calibration jar to accept the gill grater. So you'll need an accessory item, which basically has, you know, this is considered the calibration jar where you have an inlet and an outlet, because you really have no way of directly fastening the tubing to the calibrator when you're using a cyclone. So using this device, from there what you're doing now is you're actually setting your flow rate to make sure that there's uh, uh, no influence by the cyclone in, in the flow rate and all that that, uh, that you want to work with initially. Record keeping, again, there's a lot of different forms out there. I think there is an OSHA standard form that they recommend using just to make sure that you include all the parameters that are needed. I think you may find that too on a you know on this OSHA OSHA website. That's pretty much it. So what I want to do though is is uh, show you this document and we can email this to you too if you're interested. I mean, I got this off of the uh, off of the OSHA website, but what's good about this is that you'll see that um, it gives you a lot of different guidelines here for doing your air sampling and, and um, all the information that you'll need um, really through some of these documents. Yeah, it's great, Dan. Actually, we can probably just send that out uh, to everyone that's um, participating in the webinar, and uh, if they want to use it, they can. If not, it's not a problem. Um, yeah, at this point, if anyone has any questions, um, please use a little chat box on the bottom of the, uh, it should be on the right-hand side of your screen, and we'll try to answer those. Um, if you need to talk to us offline, you can do that as well. You can contact me. Uh, again, my name is Tom at RACO, or you can contact Dan Bingham at uh, Sensodyne. I'll send something out with our contact info if you'd rather talk offline about something. And if there are no questions, we'll, uh, we'll sign off here. So thanks again for your time, Dan. Thank you for everyone that's uh, spent a little bit of your morning with us. Hope you found this uh, informational. Um, we will have this available on our website. If you go to RACO, go to our training page, and there's a, uh, a webinar tab and it shows all our old webinars on there. So if there's no questions, thanks again, and uh, we'll talk to you all soon. Thank you.